Now, that's more than enough from me. I'm sure I've <coughs> overstayed my welcome. What you're really here to do is to listen to our guest speaker. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to him. Trevor Dyer comes to us today with an impressive professional backstory. He began his career as a legal executive, handling property and probate cases before retraining as a legal accountant. He's now partner and head of finance and administration at Bretherton's LLP, as well as a member of the law management group and the managing partner forum. For any of you who believe that the prospect of becoming a partner in a law firm is remote, Trevor is the perfect illustration of what I was just saying. In a legal career spanning more than 40 years, he's a shining example of what chartered legal executives can achieve, and I'm absolutely thrilled that he's agreed to share his wisdom with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please would you welcome Mr. Trevor Dyer. Uh, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, graduates, friends and family, um, last year's distinguished speaker um, was Lord Phillips of Sudbury. Um, times must be getting hard at Silex because all you've got is me this time. Uh, I, I blame Diane for that. Uh, I think she wanted two people from football to speak today and apparently she um, wanted Sir Trevor Brooking and uh, the Middlesbrough footballer, Kieran Dyer. So she Googled Trevor and Dyer and uh, came up with me, sadly. Never mind. So why am I standing here today as your guest speaker? I think there are two main reasons for that. Uh, firstly, um, I'm very old. Um, I will, in fact, be turning 60 next week. Um, I'm not yet pushing up the daisies, but I've bought the seeds and I've got the trail. Secondly, I've spent a lifetime in law since leaving school. So I thought what I'd do today is to offer you seven tips on this, the first day of the rest of your professional lives. It was almost 44 years ago that I went home after a particularly boring A-level maths lesson and said to my mum, I want to join the Navy. <clears throat> uh, back in those days, you needed your parents' consent to join up if you were only 16. And my mum wasn't about to let me do something as exciting uh, as gallivanting around the world on a warship drinking rum. No, she said, <clears throat> go and get a proper job. So I did. I uh, went for an interview at a law firm in Northampton uh, and I got a job as a trainee legal executive. I say trainee legal executive, that's rather puffing it up a bit. Uh, in my first few weeks, I learned how to sew up a will uh, and to use sealing wax. The first bit, sewing up a will, came in very handy when I moved to Winchester and I had to sew my own shirt buttons on. Mum had accepted that, that the world was big enough to allow me to um, extend my career to a county on the coast, even if I couldn't go beyond it on a ship. It was great fun at my, my first firm. Uh, occasionally, they'd let me cover on reception. And uh, it didn't get off to a, a great start, however. On one of the first days this old boy came into the office and said simply, Mumby, 10 o'clock. Uh, I correctly interpreted this uh, as uh, a gruff old bugger saying he'd come to see the senior partner, Charles Mumby, and that he'd got an accurate watch on. I asked who he was, and again, gruffly, he responded, Spencer. My legal career nearly came to an end there and then when I rang Mr. Mumby and told him that Mr. Spencer was in reception to see him. I'll have you know I'm Lord Spencer, boy, was his response. Lady Diana's grandfather uh, was a bit of a miserable git, if I'm honest. <laughs> so, tip one for you young graduates. Seize any opportunity that comes along. 
Uh, I decided to specialise in probate and conveyancing, and uh, a few years later the firm asked me if I wanted to do conveyancing for Lord Spencer's Oldthorpe estate. Um, pleased to say by then we'd moved on to acting for the much nicer Johnny Spencer, the eighth Earl, rather than his dad, um, Lady Diana's father. Um, but it got me doing some interesting work, settled land uh, and drafting leases of monuments and things like that. So try and do some specialist and niche work if you can. It also reminded me that I couldn't win every opportunity that presented itself to me. Why Lady Diana should have chosen the future King of England instead of me, a council house lad, I'll never know. She drove a red metro in those days, and you can tell how old I am. Most of you probably don't know what a metro is. As you will be aware, Silex has applied to the Legal Services Board for independent practice rights for qualified chartered legal executives to undertake reserved activity work, such as probate, conveyancing, litigation, advocacy and immigration work. If successful, you would be able to set up your own full-service law firm and either practice on your own or with other chartered legal executives. This is well overdue. It would be recognition beyond the granting of royal charter that this is a professional qualification that is worth the huge efforts that you've put in to achieve. But, moving on to tip two, the law moves at its own pace. Uh, the Institute of Legal Executives, as it became in 1963, was the body that I joined in the early 1970s. Whilst respected by the upper echelons of the legal profession, the barristers and the solicitors, uh, it didn't have anywhere near the gravitas that it now has. So we've come far, but I recall that it was around 25 years ago that the Solicitors Regulation Authority, then the Law Society, first started talking about non-solicitors becoming partners in law firms. And that's all they did, just talk for 20 years. I've been treated at my current firm as one of the partners for 20 years now, but I was only allowed to become a partner four years ago when the Legal Services Act allowed it. I fear we may have the same problem in getting approval from the Legal Services Board. Um, I hope I'm wrong in that, and we aren't about 20, a 20-year 20 dialogue. So I'm a partner in a law firm, so what? To me, it's more important that I'm a partner in a successful law firm. I'm self-employed, and as such, I need the firm to be successful in order to earn a living. Which moves me on to tip three. And I apologise to those who work for local government that much of what I'm saying applies to private practice. Tip three, partnership is a high-risk and an uncertain reward structure. It is not for the faint-hearted. I do hope that some of you will aspire to run your own firms or to become partners in your existing firms. However, if all you are looking for is the badge of having made it to see your name on the note paper, you shouldn't be doing it. You should look upon partnership as being a temporary custodian of the firm. My firm has been going for over 200 years, and I've only been a part of it for 10% of its existence. I may be a stakeholder, but in reality, I'm just a nanny, playing a part in the growth of the child that is Bretherton's LLP. If you should become a partner in a law firm, you can expect to be more influential. But a word of warning, it doesn't necessarily make you more successful. You just have to ask the ex-partners of Hallowells, Cobbetts, Blakemores, etc. 
The law is a £22 billion service sector, and law is a business for 99% of those who do it. There are winners and losers in business, and one firm's success will come as a result of another firm's failure. If you are going to go into business in or as a law firm, then please do it with your eyes wide open. It is flattering to be asked to become a partner of a law firm, but see further beyond the badge. I know of partners who have signed up to partnership without seeing the firm's accounts or looking at its negligence claims record or its disciplinary record or checking out the commitments on building leases. Lawyers do things themselves that they'd never advise their clients to do. So proceed with caution, folks. 20 or 30 years ago, you had to be a white male to make it to the top of a law firm. I look around the room today and I see how all that has changed. Our firm is now dominated by female lawyers. We made up five partners in April, and only one of them was a bloke. At last, the old guard is being dismantled, and we're starting to see parity at the top level. I'm absolutely delighted that three of our 19 partners at Bretherton's are chartered legal executives. Tip four, never compromise your position. The oath that you'll be taking today is not just a statement. It reflects the principles that you must adhere to as a qualified lawyer. You must set yourself the very highest standards and keep to them. Never be tempted to do what a client wants you to do if it's unethical. You've worked hard to gain your practicing certificates. Don't be foolish enough to risk losing them by doing something that a professional shouldn't do. Tip five, never stop learning. You should be proud that the hard work that you've put in to pass your Silex exams and qualify as a fellow has all been worth it. However, this should not be the end of your learning journey. Feel free to take a break now and gather your breath before you go on. As I've said, the legal profession continues to change. New entrants to the market, new ways of providing legal services will continue to challenge the status quo. I'm a great believer in looking over the hill and seeing what's coming next. That way, you can be ready and accepting of the new ways of delivering the law. I recommend to you all that you go out and get hold of two books to read that will help you be better placed for what is coming. Because change is definitely coming. Go out and buy or borrow. I won't say steal, in view of what I've said about never compromising your values. These two books. The first one is Avoiding Extinction, Reimagining Legal Services for the 21st Century. It's by Mitchell Kowalski. It's written in the style of a novel about a US lawyer, but it is eye-opening about what clients will be expecting from their lawyers in the future. One of the key lessons in it is that clients will continue to want more for less. You need to come up with new and innovative, innovative ways to add value for your clients and to reduce their legal bills, otherwise someone else will. The second book is Tomorrow's Lawyers, An Introduction to Your Future. This is by Professor, Professor Richard Susskind. Now, I rate this guy 
only behind Professor Stephen Mason uh, as a leading advisor to law firms. The key lesson in Professor Suskin's book is that IT will provide much of what you do now. There will be virtual courts, huge knowledge banks, and all legal documentation will be available online. It's essential that you remain IT literate. At present, a computer has the processing power of just one human being. By 2050, a simple PC will have the power of all humankind put together. Imagine that. The knowledge of every lawyer in the world on one hard disk. Both of these books will give you an insight of what legal services will look like in the year to come. Myself, I'm at the end of my career, so not much will affect me. But you're at the start of your career, so you need to know where things are going to remain at the top of your game. Tip six, value your worth. As I said, law is a business. A firm carries out legal work with a view to making a profit for the partners who own it. They do that, to put it quite simply, by renting your legal brains. And they pay a fee for that. It's called your salary. They then rent out those legal brains to clients at a higher fee in order to make a profit. The ratio between what the firm pays you for your brain and what the clients pay the firm reflects your worth. The more specialist and niche work that you do, the more clients will be prepared to pay the firm to rent your brain. The more the clients pay, the higher your value to the firm. The expectation of any firm will be for you to bill a minimum of three times your salary. If you're generating fees for the firm of, say, five times your salary, you're worth more to the firm and should ask to be better rewarded. But money isn't everything. Which brings me on to my last tip, tip seven. Work hard and play hard. In order to get on, you have to stand out from the crowd. My firm appointed five partners in April, but there are others who would have wanted to become a partner, but didn't make it. Why? Because they didn't, didn't stand out from the crowd as being ready for it. My daughter is on the first rung of the ladder to becoming a chartered legal executive, having just undertaken her first level three studies. At her firm, she's being recognised as being one who stands out from the crowd due to the hard work that she puts in for the firm and the extra efforts that she's made when compared to her peers. Working hard at being a successful lawyer at your firm is not the be-all and end-all, though. There is more than work to live a fulfilled life. Make sure you fill every second with living life to the full. Work just as hard outside of the office as you do in it to ensure you'll have no regrets later on in life. I would suggest you get that bucket list put together now and start working your way through it. Do things that make you happy. I've entered the Banbury Triathlon next month and I'll get great satisfaction that I can still do challenging things. I'm off to Glastonbury in July because I've never been to that festival. I did an extensive tour of India because it's a country I've always wanted to go to 
and I was not disappointed. It was the best thing I've ever done. The next item on my bucket list is to watch the Ashes Test in Perth, Australia, which I'll be doing at Christmas. You've worked hard to get where you are today, and I commend you all for it. But please remember, life is short, and you only get one go at it. You've got a lot longer left than I have, but don't let your life eke away. Make every second count. Thank you all for listening to me. I hope that just one of those seven tips has struck a chord, even if all of them aren't appropriate to you. But thank you for listening. <laughs>